I've been a forest ranger for the U.S. Forest Service for over a decade now. I've seen some strange and unsettling things out in the woods that still haunt me to this day. But there's one incident in particular that I'll never forget, no matter how hard I try. It was a crisp autumn evening in early October of 2018. I was on patrol duty at the Monongahela National Forest in West Virginia, not too far from the town of Elkins. It had been an uneventful day, and I was looking forward to clocking out and heading home for a hot meal and some shut-eye. Just as dusk was settling in, I got a call on my radio from dispatch. Some campers had reported strange noises coming from a remote section of the forest, and they sounded freaked out. Against my better judgment, I told dispatch I would check it out before heading in, even though it would be getting dark soon. I drove down a narrow access road, parking my truck at the closest trailhead to where the campers had heard the disturbing sounds. Clicking on my heavy maglite flashlight, I headed into the trees, dried leaves crunching under my boots with each step. An eerie mist was starting to snake its way through the bare trees, and the air smelled heavily of rotting foliage. About a mile in, I reached a small clearing by a creek. I played my flashlight beam across the ground and spotted something near the water's edge that made my blood run cold. It was a hiking boot, splattered with dark liquid. I broke out in a cold sweat despite the chill. Sweeping my light across the forest floor, I spotted a second boot about 20 feet away and then a torn, blood-stained jacket. My heart thudding in my ears, I followed the unsettling trail of discarded clothing and belongings to a large oak tree. Stealing myself, I directed my flashlight up the tall trunk. My knees almost buckled at what I saw. A body was splayed across a thick branch about 15 feet up bent at an unnatural angle. Scraps of a red flannel shirt fluttered from the branch, but the rest of the torso had been shredded, jagged white ribs protruding through tattered flesh. The lower half of the body was missing. Reeling from the horrific sight, I fumbled for my radio with a shaking hand, barely able to press the button. But the radio only crackled with static. The steep ravine must have been blocking the signal. I was on my own with no backup. That's when I heard it, Somewhere off to my left, not too far away, a wet, crunching, slurping sound that turned my stomach. Slipping behind a large tree trunk, I peered out from around it, aiming my flashlight in the direction of the sickening noise. My heart nearly stopped. Hunched beside a fallen log about 30 feet away was a dark figure, illuminated in the spotlight glare of my trembling flashlight beam. The size and shape of a man, but naked, with pale white skin stretched drum tight over a emaciated frame. Lank, dark hair hung in dripping ropes around its head as it crouched over something, making those awful wet ripping and gnawing sounds. When my flashlight beam found it, the creature whipped its head around and I got a look at its face. I'll never forget those eyes, glowing red like embers in the spotlight. That face, nose missing, cheeks hollowed out, mouth a ragged hole rimmed with needle teeth and dripping with black fluid and strands of flesh. It let out a shrill, gurgling shriek that turned my legs to jelly and nearly made me lose control of my bladder. With an agility that seemed impossible for its wasted frame, the creature sprang up and began scrambling over the log on all fours like a crab in my direction. Pure adrenaline took over at that point, propelling me through the woods in a panic sprint tripping over roots and slamming into branches that raked against my face and arms. But I didn't feel a thing, just the roaring of blood in my ears and the all-consuming urge to get as far away as possible from that nightmarish monstrosity. I don't remember how I found my way out of that forest and back to my truck on that moonless night. They found me in the morning, curled up on the floor of the cab, covered in scratches, clothes torn and muddy, nearly catatonic with fear. They said I kept muttering over and over again, it's face, it's face. When I gained some degree of coherency back, I led a team of rangers and local police to that clearing with the big oak tree where I had witnessed the grisly sight. But the mangled torso was gone, only a slick of dark blood on the branch remaining. No other sign of the body and no sign of the creature. The only thing we found was a strange symbol carved into the trunk of that oak tree. It looked like a triangle with a line through it, almost like an eye. And on the ground near the base of the tree, a wreath of some kind made of sticks, bones, and clumps of hair. 
no one knew what to make of it. After a fruitless day of searching and investigation, the whole incident got swept under the rug, attributed to a bear attack in my confused mental state. They placed me on a leave of absence and I started going to weekly therapy sessions to cope with the trauma. Deep down, I know what I saw out there was real. No bear attack could possibly explain it. Sometimes I still see that wasted pale face with the glowing red eyes when I close my own at night. I've never gone back to those woods and I've since quit my job as a ranger. But I think about that symbol carved on the tree a lot. And I've done some digging into the history of that forest. I found out that back in the early 1900s, there used to be a small village of coal mining families on the edge of what's now the National Forest Land. In 1923, the whole population, 37 men, women, and children, vanished without a trace overnight. The only clues left behind were strange symbols painted on the doors of the abandoned cabins, symbols that resemble the one carved on that tree. I don't know what happened to those villagers or what's lurking in that forest. And I'm not sure I want to know, but I'll always wonder, and I'll always remember that night out amongst the trees, face to face with something that shouldn't exist in this world, something evil. I've been a forest ranger in the Olympic National Forest in Washington State for over a decade now. I've seen some strange things out in those woods that I can't fully explain. But there's one series of events from a few years back that still haunts me to this day. It was early October, and the leaves were just starting to change colors. I was doing a routine patrol through a remote section of the forest, a place I'd been dozens of times before without incident. It was a chilly morning, colder than usual for that time of year. I zipped up my green ranger jacket and headed down a trail. About two miles in, I started to get an eerie feeling like I was being watched. The forest that was usually alive with the sounds of birds and small animals was dead silent. The hair on the back of my neck stood up. I quickened my pace, eager to check this section and head back to my truck. Suddenly, a twig snapped behind me. I spun around, my hand instinctively reaching for the bear spray on my belt. But there was no one there. I scanned the dense foliage and spotted something that made my blood run cold. There was a small, weathered sign nailed to a tree that said in crude, hand-carved letters, Turn back. I'd never seen that sign on any of my previous patrols. My instinct screamed at me to follow its advice and get out of there immediately. But I had a job to do. Against my better judgment, I swallowed my fear and pressed on. The eerie feeling grew stronger with every step I took. It felt like there were eyes on me from every direction. I kept checking over my shoulder, but I never caught a glimpse of anyone. After another half mile, I reached a small clearing and stopped dead in my tracks. Hanging from a high branch was a ragged, torn backpack covered in what looked like old, dried blood. A cold sweat broke out on my forehead. I wanted to investigate, but I couldn't bring myself to step any closer to it. That's when I heard it, coming from the direction of the backpack, a low, guttural growling that no animal I knew of could make. It sounded almost human, but not quite. My mind screamed Wendigo, even though I'd always dismissed old Native American legends as mere myth and superstition. I turned and ran faster than I'd ever run before, crashing through the undergrowth and not stopping until I reached my truck over two miles away. I radioed the incident in to the ranger station with shaking hands. They sent out a search party to scan the area, but they found no trace of the backpack or any other signs of the disturbance. I avoided that remote stretch of woods after that, but I couldn't stop thinking about it. A few weeks later, I was in a local diner when I overheard a couple of hunters talking. They were telling the waitress about an old concrete bunker they'd stumbled upon deep in the Olympic National Forest. The hair stood up on my neck as they described the location. It was the same general area where I'd found the creepy sign and bloody backpack. The hunters said the metal door of the bunker had strange symbols carved all over it, symbols that gave them a really bad feeling. They did not go inside and hightailed it out of there. That night, I did some research online about the area. I found a few vague local news articles from the 1970s about a commune that had set up in a remote patch of forest and then vanished without a trace one winter. 
Some thought they went off to live in isolated Alaska. Others suspected a more sinister fate. There was speculation they were mixed up with occult and devil worship. No solid leads or evidence of what happened to them was ever found. I couldn't shake the disturbing idea that the bunker could somehow be connected to the vanished commune or cult activity. I had a terrible feeling that these woods held dark secrets never meant to be uncovered. The next morning, a Saturday, I went into the ranger station even though I was off duty. I was determined to find that bunker, just to settle my own unease. I studied some maps and pinpointed a likely location based on the hunter's description and headed out there alone, which I knew was foolish and against protocol. The forest felt different that day, seeped in a kind of sinister stillness. I kept imagining I heard whispering voices and almost felt like I was in a trance as I searched for the bunker. The snapping of a branch behind me jolted me alert. I turned and saw the decaying remains of a deer carcass swinging from a tree branch. I hadn't heard any sounds of a predator. It was like it had been hung there intentionally by someone. And the way it had decayed didn't seem natural to me. I stumbled away from it, my heart pounding. And that's when through the trees I finally spotted the squat concrete bunker covered in vines and vaguely resembling an old military pillbox. As I stepped towards it, I saw the metal door was ajar, the strange carved symbols even more disturbing in person than described. Every instinct told me not to, that I would regret it, but I felt helplessly drawn to push open that door and step inside the dark, dank space. I clicked on my flashlight with a trembling hand, the beam fell upon an awful sight that will be forever seared in my memory. Bones, human bones arranged in some kind of ragged circle with unrecognizable symbols etched into the dusty concrete around them. It looked like some sort of dark occult ritual had taken place there. I spun around to run out, but my flashlight fell upon something else, a small crumpled piece of paper pinned to the wall. I grabbed it and bolted from that concrete crypt, and I ran, just like I had before ran until I reached my truck and sped out of that forest, hands shaking and sweat dripping down my face. Later, in the safety of my house, I unfolded that scrap of paper. Written on it in faded, barely legible handwriting was a single sentence that chilled me to my core. The harvest begins with the blood moon. I quit my job the next week. I couldn't stand going back into those woods. I still live near the Olympic National Forest, but I haven't set foot in there since because I know the terrible secret it holds. Every year when the October blood moon rises, I bolt my doors, close my blinds, and pray that the dark harvest that Note spoke of remains confined to those woods and doesn't spill into the surrounding area. But deep down, I know that one day it will. It's an evil too dark to remain contained.